So I was surfing the Neosphere uh, earlier today, watching some videos on YouTube and reading some blogs, um, all having to do with evolutionary theory and um, scientific naturalism uh, or physicalism and, you know, what the philosophical implications of, of these um, scientific um, understandings of the world uh, is. And uh, one of these videos was by Professor Anton, and he was responding to a discussion and debate that um, the philosophers of biology, I guess we'll call them uh, Alex Rosenberg and uh, Dupree, I forget his first name, uh, were having, where Dupree was trying to defend a sort of emergentist uh, understanding of the biological realm, which would uh, suggest that once you get to the level of uh, these emergent systems known as organisms, you can no longer understand those organisms purely by reduction to their physical components and, and to the physical laws that um, explain the behavior of, of all of the particles um, that uh, make up organisms. Dupree wanted to say that no, um, Biology will always be, uh, in a sense, a self-justifying science, and it won't need to be f justified by physics. Even a, a complete physics, a, a future physics that achieves completeness, would not be able to explain purely in its own physical terms what is happening at the biological level. Now, Alex Rosenberg is a reductionist. He wants to argue um, that, no, maybe, maybe physics today can't uh, explain organisms according to its own laws uh, and its own models of the universe, but uh, a future physics certainly will be able to explain biological phenomena in terms of physical phenomena. Now, see this here, this is, uh, this whole discussion I think between Dupree and Rosenberg is framed according to um, a certain sort of an imaginary background that has to do with or depends upon a certain bifurcation as Whitehead called it between the physical and the biological or you could say between the dead and the living between the merely material and the uh, the vital the living um, the experiential the conscious the animated it's it's you know, to think in terms of either emergentism or reductionism or either physicalism and uh, something else, like like a, um, a form of idealism. I think what what Dupree is is sort of doing here, um, this this line of argument, at a structural level, if not exactly if the content has changed over the last few hundred years, sure. But at a structural level, it's basically Kant's transcendental argument uh, that because Organisms cannot be explained mechanically, that is, according to the laws uh, of nature known to the human understand, the human intellect, the human understanding, um, you know, through uh, natural science and mathematical physics and so on. The human understanding comes to have a mechanical understanding of the merely physical, but not the biological, says Kant. Or at least, uh, when we talk about the the biological, we have to include other principles, teleology, for example, purpose. Um, we can't understand, for Kant and for Dupree, and I think also for Professor Anton, we can't understand the organic world according to um, physical principles, or mechanical principles, in, in other words. Um, and someone like Rosenberg is going to want to, well, largely ignore the whole Kantian uh, critique of any sort of dogmatism, be it an idealist dogmatism or a materialist dogmatism. The Kantian transcendental position, I think, uh, which, you know, eventually uh, morphs into phenomenology in the 20th century, and, you know, there are differences between, say, the phenomenology of of Husserl, and certainly the phenomenology of Heidegger, uh, than, than to the phenomenology of Kant, but I think something was initiated by Kant that was brought to its further fruition um, 
by these 20th century phenomenologists. So I think, you know, like Professor Anton, um, and like uh, Dupree, though I don't I don't know his work very well, but I, I think he has been influenced by Whitehead, though. Um, the this you know the way of thinking that I think I share with with these fellows is that. Um, really a phenomenological critique um, and I would level the, the same phenomenological critique against the materialist um, but once we've acknowledged that um, any sort of materialist dogmatism you know or idealist dogmatism once we've acknowledged that that's not uh, a relevant or coherent or interesting response to what there is then I think I would want to shift the conversation to talking, you know, not just about phenomenology, but about cosmology. Let's, let's talk about the world. Let's not just talk about human access to the world. Um, even though the, the, I think the only way to critique and respond to a sort of materialistic reductionistic dogmatism is through a sort of transcendental argument to say, well, but wait a minute, you're an organism, you're rational, uh, mathematical, scientific, mechanical, etc. understanding of the world is a function of your brain. And your brain is a, according to your own understanding, your, your neo-Darwinist understanding of biological evolution, your brain is just a contingently evolved uh, a product of a, a, a crude, blind uh, process. So who's to say that your brain should be capable of understanding the, the, the fundamental uh, rules and laws uh, and patterns of the natural world, of the universe at large. You have no reason as a materialist, as a re reductionistic materialist, to trust your own uh, mental capacities. And, you know, many Christians uh, and, and even creationists have used this argument against naturalism, as against the sort of metaphysical extension of naturalism. And um, I don't share their theology, but I do share their critique of of some kind of hard-nosed uh, mad dog naturalism like that of Rosenberg you know or Dawkins or Dennett sometimes uh, or any number of others um, you know Jerry Coyne whose whose blog what uh, whose blog is called uh, why evolution is true dot com um, these reductionistic materialisms I think well they're more <laughs> ideology than they are honest reflection, I think. Um, because, you know, just like George Bush after 9-11 thought that we needed to think of the world in terms of good and evil, in terms of us, the scientifically literate in, in the case of materialism, versus them, uh, you know, uh, the superstitious uh, religious nutcases. You know, Jerry Coyne, uh, will like Dawkins like you know, all of these guys will um, respond to say something like Alfred North Whitehead's um, cosmology or cosmological scheme as just uh, um, gobbledygook as as Coyne called it as a sort of obfusc obfuscation that clouds over our rational understanding of the natural world Whereas I think what someone like Whitehead is really trying to do is to say, yes, obviously the phenomenological critique of materialism applies, but once we've made that critique, we then need to learn to speculate, to do metaphysics in um, you know, a post-naturalistic way, um, but also a post-phenomenological way, which is to say once we've recognized that consciousness cannot be got around as though we could access some physical nature in itself and understand its mathematical principles. Um, no, our understanding of those mathematical principles is part and parcel part and parcel of our embodiment as these biological creatures with the brains that we happen to have. Um, but at the same time, once we've acknowledged the mediation of um, knowledge, of nature by the body and its lived phenomenology, then I think we have to take another step beyond phenomenology. 
Um, and Whitehead allows us to return to doing cosmology in a way that is not dualistic, is not bifurcated to begin with into nature versus supernature or into body and spirit or body and soul. That No, nature, the world, the universe is understood from the beginning uh, as an integrated process, as an organic whole that, yes, has you know, bodily, corporeal, material aspects, but that also that 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 that, that, that those very bodily, corporeal, material uh, aspects are themselves expressions of, and only understood in correlation with um, psychological, mental, um, you know, animated aspects. Uh, that there is a sort of interior dimension. To matter from the very beginning, and that without, in some sense, including interiority in our in our understanding of matter, we couldn't understand matter. Even the mere photon, to be understood, must be uh, attributed. You know, there, there must be some agency attributed to it. We have to attribute photons with agency in order to complete, you know, that experience, that that realization of of some form of uh, physical. Uh, manifestation. So you know, there's there's a certain time it takes for a full a full photon to realize itself. Um, we've been able to quantify this, but this quantity is itself a quality, right? There's the quality, there's the there's the experiential realization of of, of a photon, and it takes it has a certain duration. This this process of realization, right? It's um, very short, but still there's a sort of um, an arc to it. There's a sort of teleology to it. Um, and, you know, this gets snuck in at the very base of, 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 of physics, of mathematical physics, this sort of Planck, uh, principle of, uh, you know, the, the quantification of, of the photon or the, the smallest bit of matter energy that can exist. Um, and, you know, people like, uh, um, the engineer, uh, turned physicist, uh, who worked for Bell Helicopters for a while, uh, Arthur Young, uh, he wrote a book about this called The Reflexive Universe that, um, shows how teleology can't be got rid of and that even the seemingly most reductionistic, uh, physicalist perspective can only include it from the beginning in order to get the whole machine working, right? Newton had to do this. Even Einstein, in some sense, has to do this, you know. And I think the whole need for Newton to insert the finger of God was due to his lack of an understanding for gravity. He thought that there had to be some agency at work to make that force operate. But then Einstein said, no, 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 that's just the curvature of space-time. It just happens naturally as mass falls into this curvature in, in space-time. So gravity is not a cause at all. Gravity is the effect of something else. Then the whole question for Einstein becomes, well, what's space-time? Instead of saying gravity is the cause, now Einstein's really just saying, no, space-time is the cause. So what's space-time? You know, Newton said it was the sensorium of God. What does Einstein say? He starts throwing around the G word, too, whenever he starts talking about it. And whenever, especially when he starts talking about the re nature of the relationship between the f mathematical physicist's mind uh, and the E equals MC squared uh, and, and other equations that have to, to, to do with this com so supposedly complete description, mathematical description of space-time. What is the relationship between human mathematics, uh, between Einstein's equations, and the universe which realizes those equations. When, when Einstein reflected on this, he started using the word God an awful lot. Uh, and he was influenced by Spinoza and, um, you know, Mach and Leibniz and other philosophers who thought it was still worthwhile in a philosophical, if not a theological context, to talk about God. Um, you know, certainly Whitehead finds the need the need to talk about God, uh, and 
you know, the funny thing about materialists and atheists and so on is, you know, it's not that they get over God talk. They certainly hate people who talk about God positively, but they keep talking about God. They're very interested in having, they're obsessed actually with, in having a conversation with, um, you know, the most extreme fundamentalist forms of creationism and intelligent design in order to, so that they can keep themselves talking about a certain kind of God, right? So I think what I'm trying to suggest in many of my videos is that we can have another conversation, that there's a third way that doesn't require um, totally bifurcating the terms of the debate uh, into these irreconcilable um, poles, the creationist versus the atheist, the intelligent design theorist versus the neo-Darwinist. I think both of these understandings, these metaphysical interpretations of the world, uh, they each depend upon the other and they're shaped by the other and to think that atheism is somehow um, an adequate response to not only the history of human culture, but the history of the universe as we understand it, I think is is foolish and silly. And that it, you know, maybe atheism and materialism and uh, whatnot is a is a valid phase in the development of each human being's consciousness. But it's a phase, and you know, I think it's best passed through when you're 17 to 21, 22, and at that point, it's time to move beyond a negation of your cultural inheritance uh, and instead find some way of affirming uh, not only that cultural inheritance but the, the natural inheritance which precedes and informs and accompanies it. There are other ways of understanding space-time and the relationship between human consciousness and space-time that don't reduce space-time uh, to a sort of random occurrence but rather see that, no, the fact that we understand space-time, that, that it has an order, that there is a cosmos at all, such that the various things that there are in, in the world is hang together as a whole, that there is beauty and harmony at all in the universe for, you know, thinkers like Whitehead, is already evidence, a sort of empirical, experiential evidence of the existence of some intelligence, some divine lure, that in some way guides the process. Um, you know, Whitehead's God is called weak by, by theologians, by process theologians, and this is because God, Whitehead's God is not omnipotent. Whitehead's God can't reach in and alter what's happening inside space-time because space-time, nature, never fell away from God. Space-time is God's mind and body. Um, the universe is an organism, and you know, maybe what we would call the soul of that organism, um, which isn't separate from the body. Um, it's just a deeper more or more interior dimension of the body, perhaps. That, that, is, that is what we call God, right? Or at least Whitehead wants to shift God talk in the direction of, of a sort of Spinoza's pantheism, but that's inflected such that um, it's not that the universe is just this whole organism, but that there's a the, the organism that the universe is and, and realizes is a sort of process and it's always unfinished which is to say that it's creative um, so it's not as simple as what Plato had said in the Timaeus or had Timaeus say in the dialogue uh, that the universe is a living thing it's not just that it's it's in fact too simple too uh, uh, simplistic to say that the universe is just a living thing because um, this living thing exists in time. And I guess Plato did add that the visible universe is a moving image of eternity and, and there is a certain, um, you know, texture to eternity, a temporal texture, uh, in some way becoming participates in being, right? And so uh, what Whitehead and, and um, you know, other philosophers in tune with the, the way that uh, all things hang together. Um, what 
what they're pointing to is a sort of yeah in the end it's a muddle it, you could describe it as a muddle-headed way of conceiving of things because it's as if everything's blurred together and nothing is really separate from anything else um, and that God is sort of extended into uh, the world as the world um, you know I, I think it just shifts the whole conversation in a way that isn't happening yet in in these conversations like like between Dupree uh, and Alex Rosenberg um, and I think we should we should try to shift in that direction um, but you know I'm, I'm cool to keep talking about whatever everybody wants to talk about so we'll go from there <laughs>